Acts 28, verses 11 to 16. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with twin gods as its figurehead. Our first step was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so the following day, we sailed up the coast to Petrioli. Then we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so, we came to Rome. Now, again, if you have read what happened to Paul and all those two years of imprisonment in Jerusalem, and then, remember last week, we saw this entire chapter devoted to the whole ship and the storm that they faced, then you know this emotion that comes with these words. And so, we finally came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. So it's okay to meet at a bar and do worship there too, I guess, right? Verse 16, when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. We are at Rome, and we have come a long way. My goodness, how the church has grown, how the church has moved. It's amazing. In fact, actually, there should be no church in Rome. We shouldn't have a church. But we do. And when Paul gets to Rome, there's already Christians there welcoming him. How the church has grown. And the growth is a miracle. Quite often, when you're in the middle of the whole growth process, we're not aware of the amazing miracle of growth. It's kind of like if you're in an ocean drift, you don't not, you're not aware of how fast you're moving. Only when you take a look back and say, like, oh my goodness, that's a shore. I better swim back. Then you realize how much you've moved, how much you have grown. And what Luke is doing here, as he's talking about Paul's imprisonment in Rome, he's encouraging us to take a look back. Sometimes it's the snapshot, the beginning and now, that helps us to appreciate the amazing miracle of growth. For example, next slide please, the images. This is a seed of California redwood. Small, can be carried by the wind, but you plant it and when you are there every day, you don't know, but then months later and years later, what do you see? Next slide. California redwood. It grows all the way up, almost 400 feet high and sometimes 30 feet in diameter, as wide as a station wagon. Now that's a miracle from that small thing to that big thing. But when we're driving by, we're not aware of it. Sometimes you need a snapshot to realize, man, growth and life is growth is a miracle. Next slide. This is my first son, Ian. He is so cute, right? <laughs> and you're wondering what happened? No, no. He's still <laughs> and now, next slide. He's a rambunctious boy. He won't sit still for any camera now. And it's a miracle how he came from that helpless little baby to this baby, well, it's not a baby anymore, a boy and a who has his own mind, his own will. It's a miracle. Growth is a miracle. And what Luke is telling us is, stop. I've told you a lot about what is happening in the church. And in the midst of it, you didn't see it, but I want you to look back. And we want to kind of look back. Where did the church start from? We're in Rome now, but where did the church start from? Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. The church started in Jerusalem. 
way away, I mean, a huge distance. If you can look at the map, next slide, from Rome. That's where it was. How in the world does this movement in 30 years, 30 years, I'm 42, right? much less than my lifetime, go all the way out to Rome before there were planes and internet? That's amazing. What distance the church has covered. But that distance is only an external expression of bigger, more important growth and changes the church went through. Do you remember how it started? When it first started, right, when, when Jesus had ascended, it was only just a small group, 20, 25, and all of them were Galileans. They were just Galileans. They, you know, Galilee at that time was a small town nestled under the Lake Galilee from where it got its name. And it, it was a, um, you know, a, a country. And so uh, people in the city of Jerusalem would look down upon them. And, and especially the Galileans, they had an accent to them. You could say they had a, a certain drawl. Right? And, and actually, uh, many people identified the Jesus movement by their accent. Because all of them were Galileans. Jesus was a Galilean. Peter was a Galilean. And all 12 of them were Galileans. And so when, when Peter was, remember, following Jesus in the shadows, when Jesus was arrested, and he doesn't want to be noticed or seen or afraid for his own life, then one of the servants over there sees it. He says, I know who you are because of his action. You are Galilean. Because you're Galilean, you must be one of his followers. And Peter says, no, I'm not. You all are wrong. And he gave himself away. That's what it was. In the eyes of the, the Jewish leaders, country bumpkins. That's all they were. In fact, when Jesus had ascended, and these Galileans were looking up because they thought Jesus had come back with like thousands of angels, but then only two angels come down, you know how the two angels address them? Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in some, the same way you saw him go. Even the angel says, You Galileans. <laughs> you country folks. Come on. Jesus said he's going to go. Okay, kingdom of God is not now. But when the Holy Spirit comes... Why are you still standing here? Go. That's why it was in Jerusalem, Galileans. And then at the end of chapter 28, it's in Rome, the capital of the empire, the place of great Colosseum and the forums where you could meet almost any person from every corner of the earth, where there was market and sales, where there was aristocrats write a few laws and make a whole province be decimated. In that place of power, you see uh, Paul preaching and receiving encouragement from Christians who are not from Galilee. That's amazing. Galilean followers of Galilean rabbi. You should have died in Galilee. In Rome, you have non-Galileans following a Galilean rabbi. Uh, you have Aramaic-speaking people following the Galilean rabbi. You have actually Greek-speaking people following the Galilean rabbi. You have Hebrew-speaking. Ah, wow. And Paul was not from Galilee. Paul was not a country bumpkin. He didn't have a certain draw. I'm just making an analogy. Not that any, there's anything wrong with Southern Troll, okay? I'm just trying to put some analogy. And he spoke perfect Aramaic, you know, graduated, uh, high honors, Gamaliel, Harvard graduate, uh, spoke eloquent Greek, and he spoke a commanding Latin that he could stand before all the Roman officers and argue for himself. He could quote Moses, Cicero and Plato all in one breath in their own respective language. 
that Paul in Rome preaching about the rabbi from Galilee. That's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, how is this possible? So historians do that, right? You see an event. You see a result of the event. Now, what caused it? What is the power behind it? And so historians look at different factors. And so we're looking. Is it charismatic people? Was Jesus himself a charismatic leader? Actually, when you look, compare him to other religious leaders, he was a failed leader. He died, and all his followers were hiding in the basement. Um, Muhammad, now he was a better leader if you want to talk about wielding power, because when he died in 632 AD, he already had a standing army, and he had united all the Arabia tribes under one Islam political religious identity. So actually, when he uh, passed away, the movement was already strong. And so whenever they look at Islam, they could always point to Muhammad. And we look at Jesus, and when he left, there was just, we just saw Galileans in Jerusalem. They must be his followers. Yes, it must be some charismatic leader who followed after him. So it could be Peter. But then, you know, did you notice how Luke tells us the story of this Christian movement? He does tell about Peter, but then after Peter, there's an amazing first conversion of a Gentile, Cornelius. He just drops Peter's story like it was yesterday's news. What happened to Peter? Luke seems to say, actually, Peter is not that important. Wasn't Peter the reason why the church grew? He helped. But really, it's not Peter. And he moves on to Paul. So he must be Paul. And Paul is amazing. We've been doing all the mission trips. But then, at the very end of it, we don't see what happens to Paul. Do you remember? He's trying to go to Rome because he's going to have a showdown with the Caesar. And he's going to stand before him and tell him about Christ. So, that, you know, that's like the climax of the story. And, and so Luke should tell the story, but Luke doesn't tell it. We're going to read a little later. Luke tells about Paul was in prison and, all right, that's the end of the story. What? It's kind of like watching a movie and, you know, there's this uh, two, right, the hero and the enemy. You know their, uh, their fate is going to meet in one place and they're going to fight. Now, as they see each other and they're looking at each other eye to eye and they're about to duel it out and the credits roll up. We want my money back. But you see, Paul wasn't the hero of the church either. It wasn't because of Paul that the church grew. So how did this Galilean movement of Jerusalem go all the way out to Rome and become international? Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, the Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The power behind the growth, the birth and the growth of the church, which you say the life of the church is the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This is what Luke is trying to say. As we finish chapter 28, and as we look back and see the snapshots, the main points of Luke becomes more lucid, more clear. And the first thing he's saying is, the growth of the church is a miracle. It didn't happen because of any charismatic leader. It happened by the power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gives the power of growth. Church, yes. And even our own life. And think about it. Even, even just life in general is a gift and the power of God. I mean, the way our cells multiply, right? You know, you know, women get pregnant, and so they have the heavier work than men, right? Men help make the baby, which is very easy, but then the women have to carry the baby. But women do not make the baby. It's not like the women guiding all the cells, right? 
saying, kidney cells, you are now those eye cones. No, it just happens. And what the woman is doing, just giving space for God to multiply those cells. Even now, you, right, you are growing and changing. And you're not even doing anything about it. Every minute, about 10 million new cells, you right? Wink, close your eyes like this. You just created half a million new cells. Wow. Congratulations. But you're not even thinking about it. Even this basic fundamental life is the power of God in us. It's a gift of God. And so it is in the work of God too. The church grows because of the Holy Spirit. You and I grow because of the Holy Spirit. So it's not our work. Then what must we do? Here again, one of the most important themes on the book of Acts. The best thing that we can do is we can position ourselves to let the power of God come to us and then release through us. We can position ourselves. We can't do it on our own, but we can position it. And how, does, how do we position ourselves? What is the act of positioning ourselves to receive the power of God? Even Jesus says, you wait and pray. It was prayer. It's prayer. Prayer is how we place ourselves before the power of God to come and to go through us. And so we saw this, right? In the upper room, they're praying. And Peter, when he's praying, is when he receives a vision and finally goes to a Gentile. And Paul, to even Paul, he thought he received a vision. He was ran away, you know, he was pushed away from Jerusalem. He was hiding in Tarsus, remember? He had no place to go. He had to go back to his father's place. And, and he was in the basement of his father playing Xbox 360 because he had nothing to do. And then Barnabas calls him. And then as Barnabas and Paul is praying and laying their hands on him, then he sees the call for the mission. It wasn't, again, Paul himself. It was their prayer that positioned themselves. Prayer. So friends, I want to ask you guys, are you living in the power of God? If you and I are not living in the power of God, then it's because we are not praying. As simple as that. Before we try to find blame on, man, it's because of my spouse who doesn't support me or my children who are always annoying me or my boss or my co-workers. Before that, are you praying? The apostles, we see them constantly praying. We saw them praying three times a day. Even though they touched Jesus Christ, heard Jesus' message with their own ears, even they, Peter, still need to pray morning, noon, and evening. And how are you praying? Oh, there's an amazing power of God waiting to be released. But we're not placing ourselves before it because we're not praying. Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, was said to pray three hours a day in the morning. And one of his students said, you're so busy, you've got so many things to do. You know, how can you pray so much? And he says, I am too busy not to pray. You know, as I've been uh, meeting with some of you guys, I, I've been very encouraged because uh, many of you guys took the challenge. Uh, remember we said, uh, let's just go to some of the basic spiritual disciplines. The apostles prayed morning, noon, and day, and we put it up on our website. Morning, noon, and day. Say simple prayers. It doesn't have to be long. Okay? You don't have to do three hours. But every, those time slots... Uh, Claiming the schedule to belong to God and not to my business or to any of my employees or employers. And but to say it belongs to God and then to pray morning and And many of you guys are doing it. I would encourage you to continue to do that. And that is positioning yourself for the power of God. For those who have not, I would encourage you. It's a simple thing. It's not an immediate thing. But it is like growth. It takes time. But when you look back, Wow, that seed became the towering California redwood. Your faith will grow when you place yourself before God in prayer. Another thing Luke is saying to us is this. 
but with every growth, there are growing pains. There's always growing pains. Suffering is another part of this whole story, isn't it? All throughout the story, we see that the apostles, whether it be Peter or Paul, they face suffering. Now, it would have been really easy for them not to face suffering. If only they shut up. If they didn't go around and Peter going to the Jerusalem, Jerusalem and say, hey, you guys, you crucified Jesus, but he's alive. Man, that would upset anybody. Like, Come here, I, I need to you know, silence you. If he didn't say that, then the Jews would have no problem. If they stayed just within their own Galilean folks, no one would have any problems. But man, Peter had to open his mouth and start telling him about Jesus' rose and, and the leaders, they crucified him. Why? And repent. And so suffering came his way. He was in prison. He was beat. And Paul too. Paul should have just stayed in Tarsus. But no, he had to go all around different cities, Lystra and Derby, and get stoned. Just stay home. Play it safe. But here's the thing. If you and I really want to grow, then we must expect suffering and endure it. So Acts chapter 9, verse 15 through 16. But the Lord said, so this is where Jesus Christ meets Paul. Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Suffer. At first, it might sound like and Jesus is like to say this, like, I, I want Paul to suffer a lot because he killed Stephen. It's not that. What he is saying, this guy is going to be so on fire for the kingdom. He is going to be all in. That As he seeks that out, the suffering that naturally comes because of the amazing sacrifice you have to make, he's going to endure it all. That's what it means. See, uh, we Christians are not supposed to seek suffering, but we should not shun suffering either. Uh, we do not seek, we do not run away, but actually we seek God's kingdom, and when we do it, inevitably there are growing pains. Inevitably there will be opposition. Inevitably, your selfish desires will battle against God's desires, and you must make sacrifice. When you sacrifice, you will suffer. But here's the thing, that is part of the growth. When it's difficult, when you're frustrated, when you're suffering, when you're doubting, then you're growing. If you're not suffering, if there's no pain, then you're already dead. Death is the most peaceful thing. When you're growing, when you're seeking to do the will of God, inevitably there is suffering. And I wonder if our modern Christianity has capitulated to the sense of the blessing means that everything is working out. And we've sought convenient Christianity over the kingdom Christianity, which again, it's not seeking of suffering, but inevitably brings suffering and difficulties. I might have shared this story with you. Uh, a guy named Kevin who was on church for a while, he was helping me fix my car, and, and I asked him, you know, why you didn't go to church? And he said one of the times that his friend asked him to go to church, and this is the way he told him, you should come to our church because we have Starbucks. And so this unchurched guy was saying, what does Starbucks have to do anything with the church? I could go to Starbucks across the street. I wonder if we have fallen to the understanding, false understanding, convenience. Uh, I want to go where it's convenient for me, so where everything's all laid out for me, and where its growth is simple, and it's stages. But growth that really challenges us and makes us grow internally. It's not smooth. And there's a lot of suffering where we must sacrifice conveniences. And I must say, actually, even this crowd, you guys, you guys are like that. You guys are here in a church plant. Right? You're sacrificing a lot of convenience you can find in other places. But you're here because you see the vision. And you're ready to do it. And guys, when we go to a new space, there's going to be a lot more inconveniences. Like we've got to clean the toilets. 
but you're ready to do it. Clean the toilets for the kingdom of God, right? Amen? <laughs> because the gospel and the kingdom calls us, and what's most important is obedience. And all the inconveniences is okay. And you will endure. And when you do it, you will look back and say, wow, God, thank you for growing this faith in me. The last thing is this. It is the Holy Spirit, the power of God, that brings the power of growth. It is our prayer that positions ourselves to it. And when we're seeking God, uh, there will be growing pains but we can be bold about it because God is faithful. That's another theme in the book of Acts. Luke wants to say, Holy Spirit, power, endure suffering. Don't run away from it. Don't run into it, but don't run away from it. And pray. And you know what? Be bold about it all too because God is faithful. Acts chapter 28. These are the last verses of his story. For the next two years... And Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. Do you remember again what Jesus' promises was in Acts chapter 1, the very beginning, and that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth? Where is Paul now in Rome? In one sense, he's like the center of all the empire. So the ends of the earth, I mean, he's reached it. Why is he there for? He's going to stand and give witness. I mean, literally, he's going to go to the witness stand. Oh, how faithful God is. What God said, what will be done? is being done. Paul knows this. Paul knows that whenever he has received the call, that God is going to do it because it's God's power. And all I need to be is bold, be bold about it. And we saw this, isn't it? In, even in the Acts chapter 27, when the ship was being thrown about by the terrible storm, and everybody in the boat was scared for their life, and they were throwing up, and because they were throwing up, they couldn't eat because whatever they ate came out. What was Paul doing? He was eating. Very confident. Uh, how can you eat? I'm hungry. And then he goes, you want to join me? Why don't you eat with me? And then he does the Lord's table communion in that place. Right? So much confidence. How, where does he get that confidence? Because he knows. God said he will go to Rome, and so he's going to be faithful to it. He has confidence in God, even though everything around him says you're not going to make it. The stars and the suns were blocked out. It was dark for 14 days. Everybody was scared for their life, even the ship's captain. But Paul was not because, not because he knew a lot more, but because he knew one thing. And God promised and God keeps. And so I'm going to be bold. The church growth is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what is asked of us is prayer, and then to be bold about it. Not to be worried about it. Not to be anxious about it. Not to be scared about it. But to be bold about it. Be bold and seek those places of discomfort. Seek the places of inconvenience. Go. It could be maybe your neighbor that doesn't say hi back to you, but you offer him, come and let's have coffee with me. It could be someone in the McDonald's and you start a conversation. You see it in the heart. You see it in his eyes that he needs some encouragement, but you are thinking, you are doubtful. That if I say it, what is he going to say back? He's going to think I'm crazy, some Christian freak. No, say it, be bold. God is using you. Don't be afraid. we have a possibility of a new chapter as a church going to a new space. Are there a lot of uncertainties? Oh yeah, of course. But I'm not afraid. I'm, it's not so much that I'm not afraid for specifically new life. Actually, I'm very confident for new life. But I am confident that the church of God is strong and will continue to grow because it is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the church will 
prevail. The lesson you began was a bishop in uh, India. And his house was in Madras, which was halfway between, uh, towards the uh, uh, airport. And a lot of times, a lot of people would come there and stop by and would ask him questions about India and about the church. And inevitably, he'll be asked, uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the Indian church? And he would always answer, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And he goes on to say, because when it comes to programs, you could be optimistic or pessimistic. But when it comes to facts, you either believe or not believe. For him, he was confident the church would grow because Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus' spirit is in us by the Holy Spirit. Our God is alive in us. So endure. Be bold. Be in prayer. Christian Ferrer, uh, she was a college student. And even as a college student, she adopted uh, a kid through Compassion International. And her only source of income was the summer job. But yet, she would always gather and collect and $39 every month was sent to the Compassion Kid. Even when he did it, she didn't have a job. Never asked her parents to help out. She met somebody when she went to the seminary. She got married. But then in early 2013, she had this massive headache and she went to the hospital and they found out that she had a brain tumor. The very week, they performed surgery and they thought they got it all. A few months later, they found out that the cancer had spread. Her father, Ronnie, was devastated. For two months, just holding on to her hand, realizing that there is nothing that he can do about this. She passed away. One of those months after, he received a letter. It was from the sponsor kid in India. And when he got that letter, he wrote back to him. Your aunt Christina, he had called her aunt, had passed away from brain tumor. So from here on, I will sponsor you. He could have fallen into that depression. Why does God take away someone who's so loving at such a young age? But he chose to endure that loss. 2015, he went to visit him. Now he was 18 years old. Tearfully, they met together. And he showed him, Ronnie, all the letters that he received from Christina. When his father ran away, and Christina would write him regularly, encouraging him and giving him compassion. At age 14, he shared with Ronnie, even though my father was absent, that's when I turned to God, discovered that he loved me, and that changed everything. For him, Ronnie, he endured the loss, and they continued the work of his daughter, Christina, which was the work of Christ. The Holy Spirit does the power, miraculous, miraculous power of growth. We need to pray, need to be bold. And there will come a time when we will take a look back and we will have our own snapshots and we will be amazed what God has done through us. Let's pray. At this time, 